Stéphane Bonnet is a Thales senior expert in model and simulation based engineering. He has 15 years of active and worldwide contributions to the field of MBSE and especially with Arcadia engineering method and the Capella open source workbench. And he also has several years of engineering, coaching, mentoring, systems engineering, model based systems engineering, coaching and mentoring in various contexts and domains, uh, Thales and non Thales. And I Without further ado, I will just leave the floor to him. So, Stefan, please, you can start sharing and start your presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here to, to present some kind of a return on experiment. So, I'm, I'm Stefan Bonnet. And first of all, I have a small disclaimer of the, uh, on the title. I'm, I'm not um, absolutely convinced there's such thing as uh, engineering heaven. Um, but uh, the, the title was suggested to me by, by one of us and I kind of liked it, so I, I used it. Um, so, um, we MBSC enthusiasts, um, we are often mesmerized by sophistication of, of engineering practices. Um, however, um, not all of our architect and engineers fellows are in a situation where they can appreciate sophistication of engineering practices the same way as we do, because they are entangled in, in everyday problems uh, and, and because they are facing the pressure to deliver, they often perceive the introduction of model-based practices as an additional risk uh, for a benefit that pretty often appears intangible. So what, what I will uh, try to explain today is how uh, we, we have tried to, to cope with that and, and have a more modest approach to deploy M MBSE. Um, I, I will explain the globally the, the strategy. But first, a, a few words about Thales Avionics. Uh, so Thales is present in, in several domains, both in uh, civil and, and defense. And Thales Avionics is one of the two global business units that are related to uh, air transport sector. We have several business lines within uh, Thales Avionics. The large part addresses flight avionics with uh, avionics equipment and systems for aircraft and helicopters. Um, and we're starting to enter the drone market. Other businesses, other business lines include uh, in-flight entertainment, uh, global services, training and simulation, electrical systems. Uh, my slides are lost. Okay, now they come back. And, and microwave um, uh, imaging. These different business lines have different practices. They have different backgrounds and, and different access to uh, local support teams. Uh, in particular, flight avionics is the largest of all these business lines and, uh, and has access to a pretty strong local support teams, and that makes a, a difference. Um, what I am uh, presenting today spans between early 2020 and today. Early 2020 was right before the, uh, the COVID crisis, and it was when I joined the uh, Thales Avionics business unit. Um, it's difficult to speak about the initial context uh, that, we are, that, that we are starting from without mentioning the difficulties of the air transport sector uh, that the air transport sector has encountered during that time. So competition is increasing and, and costs must be reduced. One consequence uh, is uh, a leaner engineering and perhaps sometimes more fitted to purpose uh, products. Uh, and, and globally, there is a general trend to give more freedom to teams to organize themselves and adjust their engineering practices. Over engineering is the enemy uh, and simplification is the goal. While the intent of that is good, the consequences in terms of practices uh, uh, are not always the, um, the happiest ones. I'm just starting my, yeah. Um, our engineering teams also have a very strong um, mastering of development assurance processes. 
in particular because of the different standards uh, that are ruling our domain. Uh, still about the context, it is also worth mentioning that we have strong local support teams and something that is rare, a very capable tool development team. Uh, you all know PVMT. Uh, PVMT comes from the development teams that are shared between the uh, Avionics global uh, unit and, and another one. And, uh, and you will have other examples in this talk. In Teles Avionics, in the past, there's been some MDSC instantiations uh, that were very sophisticated with uh, a lot of automation, with variability management uh, using uh, pure variants and uh, interface generation, like um, avionics interfaces and buses and so on. The problem is that these implementations have failed to inspire the other teams for, for multiple reasons. And among these reasons, uh, I can mention two. The first one is the complexity of, of the tooling, so basically the uh, engineering workbench, and the isolation of the MBSC champions uh, that implemented these approaches. So the consequence is that in uh, early 2020, when I joined Teles Avionics, the uh, MBSC footprint uh, was, was lower than, uh, than I expected. So I've spent some time, we have spent some time, because I'm not alone on that, trying to recreate a momentum that existed uh, at some point, but vanished. So the priority was not MBSC anymore, but modernization of engineering practices. Uh, and, and I will start with, uh, with that. So our top priority is not to deploy MBC, it's to transform our engineering practices that are intensively shaped by years and years of textual requirements. And, and some of the standards uh, push us uh, in, in, this, um, in this direction. We strongly believe in capability-driven engineering supported by functional chains and scenarios. And the, the, I'm really comfortable with what, what uh, Thales presented yesterday uh, in, in the approach that they presented, uh, because this is what we believe in. Um, so functional chains are kind of system-level epics or user stories, and they help capture the purpose of, of the system. They, uh, the idea is to bring context and, and give meanings to textual requirements. So the first thing has been to work on the language. We all know Arcadia is a great engineering method, but before trying to understand the, the spirit of Arcadia and be able to grasp its benefits, mastering the concepts of purpose description, of functional analysis and architecture description is key. And this is not something that is um, mastered by all engineers. Uh, so, so we felt there was a need to, to, um, to work on that. And by the way, trying to, um, to, to formalize this vocabulary or, or the simple vocabulary um, has generated lots of discussions as a terminology in some of the uh, avionic standards um, sometimes differ. Uh, we, we don't necessarily have the same understanding of what a function is. Um, they, they, the standards talk about intended functions and so on, while we would talk about capabilities and functional chains. So sometimes things are not fully aligned. Um, the fractal pattern of, of that is, is also something that was not obvious to, to everyone. The idea that at each level of engineering, uh, teams can, could have their own end-to-end -end functional chains or is not something that is, uh, that is obvious. Um, pretty often I got the answer that functional chains were at system level only. Uh, obviously, it's not the case. This is uh, a fractal. Um, so, this, in, in this vocabulary, there's nothing really new. Uh, it was just trying to formalize it. And related to some of the uh, Thales templates that we use for uh, specification and design documents. Uh, and it was not only for Capella users, but for all stakeholders. Uh, the point of that was to explain that describing the purpose and the architecture of our solutions with this set of concepts 
was not something to be done in, in a silo, but was instead of a mean to foster co-engineering with, with uh, other stakeholders. Um, to promote this uh, vocabulary, we've um, produced a lot of, of material, uh, some handbooks and, and, and so on, guides, uh, glossaries, examples. Um, we've uh, delivered webinars and mini trainings, and we've also implemented that in the in the tools that we have to monitor R and T uh, activities and, and to frame these uh, these activities. And in all these documents, we have most of the time Capella drawings, but we don't mention Capella at all. Um, and, and one of the reason why we don't mention Capella in, in these documents is because we wanted to change the narrative. Uh, Capella has often been perceived as the tool that was delivered by the corporate. Uh, in Thales, we have the uh, particular ability to, uh, to have developed Capella. And grass is always greener on the other side. So Capella is sometimes judged negatively uh, just because it's coming from the corporate and, and it also it is perceived sometimes as a constraint. So I will come back to that slightly later uh, when, when I'll be talking about the workbench. But there was a strong need to change the narrative and help engineers consider that Capella was not a constraint, but, but a tool that could help them implement the vocabulary I, I, just, um, I just explained. So the tool is not the goal. It is an enabler. And in addition to the work on the vocabulary, we, we started to deliver introduction webinars. And this particular one, for, for example, was, was simply called 10 things you can do with Capella, but you cannot do with Visio. And this was pretty simple. Um, but but the, the enemy was Visio. And, and, and the goal was to, to, to use Capella to, uh, to, to do some of the diagramming that was until now done in, uh, done in Visio. Um, we, uh, we have also been confronted with significant uh, resistance, with people telling us that Capella was far too rich and complex, and that learning to use Capella would take weeks and weeks, and that they didn't have time to, to do that. Um, on this slide, I, I've just extracted some, some drawings that I made in, in presentations for, for a team, uh, just explaining them that um, they could just uh, generate some diagrams with, with Capella and insert them in, in, their, in their workflows uh, without uh, spending much time on Capella. And in this example, I ended up promising the team that a two or three hours training on Capella or on a very well delimited path uh, would be enough for a team with zero experience in MBSC to generate first benefits. So I really paved the, the, the way of how, which diagram they would use, which uh, tool they would use in, in the palette, and which, how they would uh, generate contextual uh, function, uh, co contextual function diagrams. So the goal was not to change one single, one single thing uh, in, in what they were doing from an engineering point of view, even though uh, it was pretty tempted to uh, speak up, but instead to simply change the way they were producing drawings and, and interface tables. Um, and, and it kind of worked. Uh, so these two last things were two very specific examples. But in parallel with that, uh, we have leveraged work that was performed a few years ago when I was part of, of Thales Corporate. Um, so this is something we worked on with Juan Navas, Eric Le Pissier, and a few others, a few, a few other persons. Um, we designed a framework to help orient and assess MBSC activities. This framework is very complete with assessment grids at different levels, and we distinguish three types of exploitation three types of model utilization. 
one is not better than the other. Uh, the goal is, is not to have everybody do uh, automation instead of, of sharing. There are just three different axes. So the goal is not necessarily to seek sophistication. More is not systematically better. The objective is to adjust the footprint of MBSC to each context, uh, taking into account project complexity, cultural background of stakeholders, and so on. Um, the first assessment, uh, the first level of assessment and orientation grid is made of 18 yes or no questions about the role that is given to the model in the engineering activities. Each project at the beginning answers these questions. So the, ra the radar that you see here on the slide shows a percentage of projects having each objective. Um, don't bother trying to analyze the data here. Of course, I have altered the, the data significantly so that you, you, you will not be able to know exactly where we, where we are, of course. Um, but with the same framework, with this framework in mind, we can recognize patterns of MBSC utilization. Um, so this is still consistent, the three, uh, the circles, Blue is share, uh, red is secure, and and, um, and dark brown is, is automate. Uh, by the way, I, I forgot to, to mention that, so maybe I will come back to, uh, to, to this. The three different levels are called share, secure, and, and automate. Sharing is improving communication and, and reducing ambiguity. So the model is not necessarily at the center of engineering, but when we want to describe things, we, we use the model so that everybody has the same understanding of things. Secure is, uh, we, we, we use the model to analyze, to evaluate, to master complexity, and, and sometimes even to drive some, of, some engineering activities like uh, VNV or transition to software. And automate is, we, we try to generate things, generate documentation, generate code, generate other models, and so on. So these are the three, uh, the three axes. And the typical patterns uh, that we see is there are the, the, the usage where models are used to formalize the descriptions of the system. This is not ne necessarily uh, really ambitious, but still uh, everybody, try, everybody knows the model and, and, and understand uh, the meaning of, of drawings. In the second category of, of usage is model is actually a driver of, of uh, more rigorous engineering activities, like um, uh, structuring, organizing engineering with capabilities, with functional chains, uh, not putting design elements in the, in the specification, and, and so on, performing functional analysis. And, and using the models has helped the teams uh, perform better engineering. And the very last one is a very sophisticated uh, implementation of, uh, of MDSC with um, a lot of automation, variability mastering, and, and so on. Um, OK, so as I uh, already mentioned, one of the goals was to change the narrative and have Capella considered as a helper rather than as a constraint. So. This led to the promotion of lots of Capella add-ons showing immediate return on investment. So I'm, I'm going to quickly browse some of, some of them. Um, so I, I said we have uh, a strong local support and add-on development capability. So you all know PVMT. You probably don't know DDV. DDV stands for Dynamic Diagram Viewer. It is a tool that computes on the fly contextual representations of model elements. Uh, we can configure what we want to see on the diagrams and exploit these uh, diagrams in HTML as well as in uh, generated Word documents um, via Intudoc. That's the first one. Second one uh, is, of course, this is not uh, right from the reuse company, but importing requirements within our models 
helps enforce the consistency of their content. For example, with uh, validation rules that help check that a requirement on a function uh, has references toward the inputs and outputs of, of the function. In terms of add-ons, sorry, M2Doc has uh, probably been the, the number one game changer these last two years. Um, it is a, a very flexible solution that, that fits our strategy of trying to find the right balance between direction, so telling people what to do, and flexibility. So we, we try to provide default template, but, but we actually allow different model organizations, different objectives, uh, and so on. And, and by the way, on, on, on these um, screenshots, what you see are all diagrams that are automatically generated uh, when we produce a document. They are DDV diagrams. Of course, there's, uh, there's PVMT, so it, it's well known, but still it's, it's, um, it's very important to uh, mention it again. PVMT is usually um, also a game changer in, in having people understand what they can get from the models. Uh, because suddenly they realize that, that, that their whole data is consistent and they can add properties and have display these properties uh, on, on different views and, and so on. So we have um, lots of different usages for, for PVMT, uh, including something that was very pragmatic, uh, the usage of uh, kind of versioning uh, in documentation generation like having a Word document, uh, taking into account a, a version property on elements to, to uh, adjust the content of, of the generation. Um, of course, when we uh, put things in the model, we want to, uh, to reuse them, and, and we are lucky enough that there are now several ways to, to query the model. Uh, through AQL expressions, through patterns, through VHY queries, and, and so on. And the data that is in the model doesn't stay in the model anymore. It is easily extracted. And I will have another example for that. And the last one is, uh, is an example where Python is used to generate markup sections that are inserted in software specifications. We have other simpler examples gathering all the relevant material of a functional chain and initializing a software epic description. So these are all very different uh, uh, pragmatic and opportunistic usage of the um, add-ons that are available in the Capella ecosystem. So we are now reaching one of the key aspects of my, of my talk today. Uh, and maybe one uh, that is a bit controversial, as it temporarily leaves on the side the uh, ambition of a global end-to-end -end ultimate connected digital thread. Um, so it's, it's something that is uh, really pragmatic. So the situation in, in 2020, uh, when, when I was talking about MBSC and what I was uh, trying to understand why the, the MBSC footprint was not as big as I thought it was, was mostly that from the team was mostly, we don't want Capella. And, and even more, we, we don't want the Thales workbench. Uh, there were several reasons for that. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the Thales official workbench is, is currently uh, undergoing its biggest transformation in, in 15 years. So we, we, we're going to have something uh, better, uh, more ergonomic, and, and so on. But then, with this um, reaction from, from the engineers, I had, we had three options. Wait for the new ultimate solution. Keep on trying to force the deployment of the standard tooling. Or acknowledge the difficulty and, and imagine a, a kind of workaround. So to me, it was not an option to, to fail at deploying better engineering practices just because of justified or, or unjustified uh, rejection of, of, of tools. So with um, the ethics department first, and, and then with, um, with uh, ISIT departments, we've been working on, on what we've called uh, the MBS pack, a kind of Capella-focused 
minimalist MBSC environment. So we had the same tools as in the official workbench. So um, connects to doors, uh, we rely on Git, um, we use pure variant and, and so on. But, but, um, um, but so we have the same tools, but, but with a different articulation and different workflows. Uh, I have proposed this, this uh, configuration. Um, I have validated this uh, configuration. I have sponsored the solution myself, even though this is absolutely not part of my mission as a systems design authority of, of the GBU. But, but I felt that there was, um, uh, it had to be done because otherwise we, we wouldn't deploy MBSC. So the requirements for the, for the solution was to have minimal configuration effort, uh, the freedom to install local add-ons by, by end users. And, and the last one was that uh, the environment that was on virtual machines had to be available for projects within a few days because it, it was not an option for me to have a team that says, okay, we, we, we would like to go with MBSC, but um, uh, how do we do? And then uh, we, we tell them, okay, we're going to start uh, the request and so on. And in two or three months, you will have your development environment ready. This was not an option. Uh, so we've worked on, on this uh, solution that is maybe temporary, but, but at least it has allowed us to, um, to, to get some, some results. And the global strategy that I've been explaining for a little while now uh, relies on several pillars. Uh, there is no question that the role of, of IT and tool teams is, uh, is crucial. But there are two other equally important aspects that have to be um, uh, addressed. And by providing end users with a simpler, more configurable, more up-to-date environment, end users retrieve some kind of control on their own tooling environment. Uh, while before that, they were really dependent on, on specialists who would configure the environment for, for, for them. So they, they, they retrieve some kind of, of control. And that includes, for some of them, the ability to uh, customize or, or, or modify uh, M2Doc templates. And the second thing is the role of the person in the middle. Uh, so I am one of these person. I know a few other ones. And these person in the middle, middle uh, are essential because they have to understand the project context and the global engineering practices. That means not only modeling, uh, but VNV and transitions to, uh, to software and, and, uh, and everything. So they have to understand the, 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 the business context and, and, and the project engineering context. They also have to have very accurate understanding of the tooling offer. What are the possibilities? What are the add-ons? What are the possible tricks? Um, what are the shortcuts we can take? What are the consequences if we take this shortcut or this other shortcuts? And what are the possible options and so on? And finally, they have to have some kind of understanding of IT department constraints and, and practices because everything cannot happen from one day to the other. So as I said previously, I, I am the Systems Design Authority of Thales Avionics. And, and, uh, and in this context, while it is not my role, I have had, for example, to coordinate the fixing of very minor issues in Capella and M2Doc, for example, regarding the way HTML descriptions were published. Uh, because uh, there were some additional lines after the, the bullet lists or, or um, merging of, of cells in capital descriptions was not working well. This is not my role, but such issues can rapidly turn into showstoppers. And if we don't address them, the, the, the teams will reject uh, not only the tool, but MDSC and, and the change of practices. Excuse me, Stefan, yes. just to let you know, you have nine minutes left. Okay, that's uh, going to be more than enough. Okay, so um, once again, uh, here is an example of a pragmatic approach. Uh, and this is not something that uh, I would have 
recommended at first, but, but this was something that delivers uh, immediate value. So we had, I, I met recently a project that had um, started M MBSE and, and they were working with uh, architecture diagrams. They were having one architecture diagram per capability. And in their process, uh, they were producing manually one table uh, listing all the functions and exchanges and, and components that were um, contributing to the realization of this capability. That was a project practice. Our recommended practice would be to use functional chains um, to, to illustrate the capabilities and then create a diagram that would be contextual and unsynchronized displaying all of all of these functional chains and, and then the content of the diagram would automatically reflect the exact footprint of, of the capability uh, but they didn't um, they didn't work with functional chains and it was not part of their global process but what we've we've been able to uh, to do was to um, implement an updated practice where the lab was still maintained manually uh, as they were as they were used to, to do but then a, a python script to extract the content of the diagram has been uh, developed so that they would generate the, the, the tables that they were previously uh, doing manually um, so it is not necessarily ambitious but it's still one step um, further like uh, uh, one, one one step uh, on the on the staircase so I'm reaching the, the end of, of, um, of my presentation. Um, I, I like the sentence by uh, Mark Twain, continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. Uh, and, and quick wins sometimes can have the potential to pave the ground for more ambitious practices. And that's gonna be my last example of, uh, of the day. Uh, so this is something that, happened that started last summer well summer 2021 and, and is uh, now continuing but in summer 2021 uh, we were called for for a project that had, uh, that was struggling with, with its uh, design with mastering it, its design and, and they were maintaining about 10 different video diagrams with different colors uh, to reflect different things such as um, the availability of, of uh, components in different modes, states. Uh, they were displaying buses and they were also displaying some kind of um, breakdown between a partner and, and themselves. And they were struggling with, with that. We started with um, reverse engineering that. So, so taking these video diagrams and, and, and doing that in, um, in Capella with PVMT. And we, we used two different anodes. And in two days, we had the equivalent in Capella than, than the 10 diagrams they had in Visio with, with just layers and so on. So that was a very quick win in a critical moment of project one. And because we had that in the model, in the model, they started to uh, copy descriptions of, um, of components in, uh, in Capella, in, in, in the logical components of, of Capella. And with that, we've been able to generate the design document. So this is the thing uh, in, in the middle. That was on, on project one, and, and uh, they, they won uh, a second version of the, of the same project. And now, uh, for, for the last three or four months, they have been working uh, on the capability-based approach with functional chains, part of their engineering workflows. And they wouldn't have being able to reach that or to, to uh, understand the power of that if they didn't have the, uh, the previous experience and the previous proof that, that the model was able to, uh, to bring them something. So this is it. Uh, every single step counts. And uh, in the last two or three years, I've, I've learned to be uh, extremely modest in setting uh, MDSC objectives. Um, but we were at the beginning of the staircase. We are a bit higher and, and we're hoping to be uh, even higher soon. So now it's time for questions. Exactly. Thank you very much, Stefan. And so we can move then to the first question. I will just bring it on screen here. You can 
seeds, I guess. Um, you have seen in several of your presentations, including today's presentation, extract of metamodel of Arcadia. Well, not today. Uh, today is a, um, it's just a simple um, visual diagram with, with the, the 15 concepts that are uh, used in, in Arcadia, but that are not, um, uh, that existed before Arcadia. So it's just a concept of uh, functions, components, exchanges, and so on. And, and uh, when, when we worked on the language, on purpose, we didn't want to um, to relate that to Arcadia because we didn't want people to say, no, but we don't want to go into Arcadia for this or this reason. We just wanted to, to, to tell them it, it, these are just concepts and, um, and, and, and that's it. How you use a concept is, is something else. I think there was something else at the end of the question, but... Um... Yeah, it would be great to have an official Arcadia data domain model, what you call vocabulary, published and reviewed by yeah. the Arcadia community. I, I think what the, the, the thing that is the closest to that is probably the um, the appendixes in, in Jean-Luc Voirin's book, because they, they clearly uh, are the most precise data models reflecting uh, Arcadia. Absolutely, uh, I would agree. Uh, next question then, let's move to that. Uh, to face your too sophisticated MBS did you at the time, simplify your model profile or even, or even remove functionalities? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, to face your sophisticated MBSC, uh, you... we, we didn't uh, change anything in Capella. We didn't implement anything. We didn't remove any functionality or, or hide any, uh, any functionality. Um, we, we just don't use uh, some, of, some of the things. Um, yeah, we, we, we try not to have too high objectives, but for sure, having a, a version of Capella in which we would have more control on, on the uh, user interface and what uh, being able to remove some diagrams, being able to remove some tools in the palettes and, and so on would be uh, would be useful. And this is I know this is something we've, we've been talking about for many years, but uh, it's never in the highest priorities of the development teams. Okay, thank you. Next question then. We have that question. Has there been any wider adoption of the MBSC pack across other areas outside of your scope? Um, no, because we haven't uh, we, we haven't tried to uh, promote it outside the uh, the Avionics um, Global Business Unit. Um, it I don't see why it couldn't be used, but once again, it's it exists because we we uh, we struggled uh, deploying our Tales workbench. Uh, some other global uh, units of Tales uh, do a better job than us. Uh, and, and for example, everything that has been presented yesterday is using the Tales workbench and and is producing great results. So it's um, once again, it's a pragmatic approach. It's not something that that is intended to replace anything. It's just a, a temporary solution uh, waiting for something better. Okay, thank you. Here is the next question. What about dynamic traceability between the model and requirements, such as what Rectify offers? I see the interface with RecIF as too static. It's a matter of, of compromise. Um, in our workflow, um, well, I have two, two, two ways to answer that. Um, in our workflow, we don't change at all the requirements in Capella. We just import them. So that means when we uh, import successive versions of requirements, we don't have any uh, specific additional work. It's just replacing the previous version. Uh, so there's no uh, complexity in the merging. Um, and, and we accept that extra work of, of, um, of importing requirements 
because on the other side, we, we gain in terms of integration, like uh, visualizing requirements in the semantic browser, being able to perform uh, queries, including requirements, being able to, um, uh, to access the requirements with, with M2Doc and, and so on. That's one thing. And the second one is um, most of the time we try to recommend aligning the structure of the doors modules and the functional tree. And in many, uh, in, well, not many, in, in a few projects, we have um, an automated synchronization of the trustability links. Like um, we receive requirements, we automatically create the trustability links or update them in, in Capella because the, um, the organization of the doors modules and the, the functional breakdown are, are the same. Okay, thank you. Next question then, let's... Uh maximize it. In the MBSE pack, do you intend to introduce some kind of ticketing tool to, uh, to e.g. handle reviews, interact with stakeholders? No. No, no we, we um, no. I don't think we will add anything else in, to the uh, MBSE pack. And, and uh, it's, it's still, the MBSE pack is, is uh, relying on, on Team 4 Capella. And, and regarding that, I believe that um, with Team for Capella, Git, and uh, and uh, separate Chira instance, and some naming conventions or whatever, we we are able to we would be able to to do things. Um, of course, we we we're looking forward to having more advanced capabilities in terms of um, reviewing models, but it's it's not something that we um, that is ready yet. So we we're just waiting. Okay. So next question then, how many were you to convert 10 Visio diagrams in a Capella model in just two days? One. One person. Yeah, okay. I, I, uh, I did it for, uh, I did it for two or three of the, of the, of the diagrams, but because the diagram, the Visio diagrams were only, uh, what was the same set of elements with just different properties in different diagrams, like, uh, is this a component available or not according to this mode and and and, and not but in in um, i did it in in um, actually in a few hours it didn't even take me one day to produce these, uh, the first version and then it took one or two days to explain the uh, the main architect of this project uh what what i did and so that he would be able to uh, to do the same thing so he started to use what I produced in Capella without having a Capella, a full Capella training, without understanding everything about Capella. He just knew one diagram, one add-on, the, the few things that he was supposed to do to, uh, to display such or such information. And that was enough for the very beginning. And now the guy is, um, one year later, the guy is, is fluent with Capella and is working with capabilities and functional chains. But the very beginning was extremely modest. Okay, interesting. So um, next question. And, and just one one thing. The, the, uh, sure. When, when I captured these diagrams, I didn't redo the engineering. The engineering was existing. It was just uh, poorly uh, managed. Yeah, of course. Okay, so regarding articulation with software, you use the Python for Capella to generate some documentation. What kind uh, of level of detail is used? Yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, in the case, in, in the project I'm thinking of, the, um, the software architects didn't feel comfortable with uh, the functional chain representation that we have in Capella. And uh, what, what they... Um, the work that is done is that the, the, the functional chains on, on this project are pretty complex and, and they are actually uh, composite functional chains made of, of more atomic ones. Um, th this is something that is possible with, with Capella. And they, uh, the systems team actually perform a transformation of the atomic uh, functional chain, so the smaller ones, in scenario diagram, in sequence diagrams, because the uh, software architects better understand the, the, the software, the, the sequence diagrams. 
and the granularity is well functions exchanges and 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 so on and what this produces is, is uh, for one given functional chain uh, a, doc a word document that starts with the functional chains list all of the atomic functional chains and their corresponding sequence diagrams and then some contextual representation of functions and and, and so on so it's a it's a level of, of detail that they had to work on they, they, there's no universal answer for that basically it was um uh anything that was necessary it's and everything that is necessary at, at system level for integration purpose and and, and that that is not um uh, starting to be uh, designed so after a few uh, initial fights between the systems and, and software teams they, they managed to, uh, to find their way and, and to, to agree on, on a particular granularity. Okay, thank you for that question. I think we have time for one more, so I'm trying to figure out uh, where is the next question. I guess that's this one. Um, ah, moved. Are some of the scripts, that's the one I was looking for. Are some of the scripts you mentioned, updating traceability in Capella based on DOS, for example, uh, shareable within or outside of Thales? Yes. Um, so th these scripts were, were were not made with uh, with Python. We we maybe we could have. Um, the thing is that it's um, the script, the one the one that synchronizes um, uh, requirements and, and functions is something that has been developed uh, add-on, so it's not uh, of industrial um, quality. So, uh, but, but there's no problem to to share it. Um, it's just that we, we wouldn't have time to package something that would be uh, clean and everything. But sharing the code, I, I think um, there's nothing... Um, uh, we, we could do it. It's just... Uh, like just by uh, an exchange of email and, and, and so on, but uh, creating something more official in the Capella Labs or, or whatever would be uh, time consuming for us and we, we don't have the bandwidth for that. But sharing the, the, the code, there's no problem. It's just, it's a uh, small pieces of Java code. Okay, and before we run out of time, I just have the same question regarding DDV, the magical diagram yeah. thingy. You talked about what is that's the status? Uh, that's another story because this one is um, I would say industrial level development um, we don't have plans to share it um, at this stage mostly because we don't have the bandwidth we don't have the resource we don't have uh, um, so so this is a, the, the main reason because there, there would be quite a bit of refactoring to put it in open source and so on. This is not something that is uh, that is free. So we are open. We are open to to that. Uh, it's not something that is in our plans right now, but we um, th this could happen. Uh, it's just I think the capital days are not the place where we would take such a decision. But feel free to come back to uh, to us on this topic and and. We, we could evaluate what, what is doable. Okay, great. Well, it's time. Uh, we don't have any more time for questions, unfortunately. So we will forward you the next questions. So okay. once again, Stefan, many thanks for this great presentation. I will just uh, bring you off stage and invite the next speaker on stage and restart my screen sharing. Thank you.